and uh, you're all very welcome this evening to our uh, public information session. Uh, I'm just going to share some slides with you now. I'll run quickly through the process um, in terms of what we're doing at the moment uh, with the development plan, how we go about making a new development plan, what the background to that is. And um, I suppose that just sets the scene for this evening's session. And obviously we're here to then answer any questions that you might have on that. So I'll try to run through this as quickly as possible while at the same time giving you uh, a, a fairly general understanding as to what we're about. Um, so what is a development plan? Well, the development plan in each instance is adopted by the elected members of each planning authority. So in this case, it's the councillors uh, elected to Waterford City and County Council will make the local area or will make the city and county development plan. Um, it's often described as a social contract between uh, the council and the, the, the population uh, of the functional area. Uh, it's done in an open, transparent way. There's lots of public consultation built into the process. There are three steps in the public consultation phases. Uh, this is the second phase of public consultation. We'll have another uh, phase of public consultation uh, early next year. Um, you know, we put ads in the paper, we go through normally public meetings, face to face town hall type meetings, but because of COVID we're doing it differently this year, but we're getting good traction. We've had a lot of people register this year, uh, just for these sessions last week and this week we've had 205 people register. Uh, we had a lot of feedback uh, from uh, earlier stages in the process. So, you know, the, the word is getting out there and uh, people are getting involved. Uh, the development plan really affects everything that the development that the local authority does, whether it's industrial, residential, commercial development. It's guided by the development plan. We use the development plan to assess planning applications. Uh, we use it as a basis to go and seek funding from central government for different projects and infrastructural provision that we want to carry out. Um, it's a medium to long term strategy, typically six years in duration. Um, but obviously, you know, we're looking at a period much beyond that six year period because, um, you know, the decisions that are taken now, the investments that are made now uh, will obviously have implications for decades to come. So typically, again, the development plan, it's a document, uh, or in our case, it's a series of documents, uh, volumes that set out the policies and objectives of the local authority. And uh, that will be accompanied then by uh, some maps. Those maps will set out broad objectives, whether they be land use, settlement patterns. In this case, what you see on the screen there in front of you uh, is uh, the zoning map for Waterford City area uh, from the 2013 plan. And that gives, I suppose, an indication as to what's going to go where. Uh, residential development, industrial development, commercial development. So it gives investors uh, some certainty. Uh, it gives the local population some certainty. You know, if you're living in a particular area, you can look at the map and you can reasonably anticipate what's going to happen across the road from you. That's the idea. Um, as I say, it gives certainty to everybody. There shouldn't be any surprises. Um, it sits within a hierarchy of plans, our city and county development plan. Uh, at the top is the national planning framework, which was adopted by the government in 2018, and that sets out the broad strategic direction for the country between now and the year 2040. Um, when that was done, then the, uh, the baton was passed on to the regional assemblies. We've got three regions in Ireland for spatial planning purposes. Uh, Waterford falls within the Southern region. Uh, so the Southern Regional Assembly set about the task of preparing a strategy for their region, which would, I suppose, give more detail to the national planning framework and show how that might be delivered at a regional scale, at a regional level. Uh, that um, plan, that regional spatial and economic strategy, as it's referred to, uh, came into effect in January 2020. And now that that's in place, each local authority has been asked to go and review their development plans uh, to give effect to that national and regional policy at a local level, uh, to tailor uh, the broad policy to particular local circumstances. Um, so that's where we're at at the moment. And below the city and county development plan, there's a further layer of what are called local area plans. And those would typically be for built up urban areas. Um, so we, at the moment, we have a local area plan for Tremor, we have one for Pelltown, we have one for Lismore. So again, it would be our intention when we get the city and county plan in place as a broad framework for the, the city and county for the next six years and beyond, that we will then start filling in the detail in local area plans. Uh, so we'll do those for 
the larger settlements, Dungarvan being the obvious one, and um, as I say, a number of other settlements, um, Tremor, Dunmore East, maybe. Um, also, we're looking at doing one for the Gwaeltacht, which has never been done before, but you know, given that it's a very particular um, set of circumstances there, That's challenges, you know, uh, it's something that we're going to do, we're going to take on, we've given that commitment. And we'll also do local area plans probably for some of the uh, some uh, locations within the city, uh, emerging areas, opportunity areas within the city where we want to try and structure and encourage and facilitate growth and development. Um, that's the national planning framework is there on the left, as I say, was adopted in 2018. And then the regional spatial and economic strategy was adopted in late 2019 and came into effect on the 31st of January, 2020. Um, what we're doing at the moment is we're coming up with a, re, a unitary city and county development plan. I suppose you, you'll all recall the city and county councils merging back in 2014. Uh, at that time, there were a number of development plans in place. There was the county development plan, which was adopted in 2011, the Dungarvan town development plan 2012, and the Waterford city development plan 2013. Uh, now, none of those plans have been replaced, so they're still the current development plans for the area, and they will all be replaced by this new unitary city and county development plan when it's eventually adopted. Uh, the plans that we have at the moment, they're very much out of date, and uh, they would have been due to expire 2017, 2018, 2019, but we were instructed by government to wait and to hold until the new national planning framework was in place and the regional strategy was in place so that each local authority wouldn't be charging ahead. Um, so they're long overdue um, uh, replacement at this stage, but we're well underway now and we'd hope to have all of those replaced with our new plan um, by this time next year. Uh, those are the local area plans I mentioned earlier. They give the detail, I suppose, that people typically uh, look for at their local level. You know, what's going to happen in terms of open space provision, um, rights of way, um, you know, what particular interventions are the local authority going to make in terms of widening footpaths and pedestrianising streets. That's where you'll find all that level of detail in the local area plan. Um, we have those for Tremor, Lismore and Port Law at the moment. And again, those continue in force until they're replaced and we'll be looking to replace those uh, starting next year. Once the county plan is in place, we will then immediately move on to the local area plan. So it's, it's a sort of, it's a, it's a rolling process. Um, the, sorry, now I'm just going to have to wait for my slide to load up again. I had a bit of a technical glitch there. Um, mandatory guidelines then, um, what are referred to as section 28 guidelines under section 28 of the Planning and Development Act, the minister will occasionally issue guidelines uh, to local authorities and these go to all local authorities so they're not just uh, addressed to us, they're addressed to every local authority in the country and they set up gen set of general guidance on things like densities, building heights, flooding, flood risk management, uh, urban design, that type of thing. And the local authority, uh, our local authority and every other local authority is bound to have regard to those, both in our day-to-day -day operations and in the preparation of our development plans. So the overview then, what is a development plan? As we say, it's an overarching strategic vision for the city and county for the next six years and the period immediately beyond that. Uh, it should set out a series of integrated policies and objectives uh, that will get us there, that will help us to realise and achieve that vision. Uh, it has to be consistent with national regional planning policy. Uh, when we adopt the development plan, when the local authority members adopt the development plan, it's circulated to um, a whole range of statutory agencies, as well as, you know, we've now circulated the draft development plan to those same agencies and it's reviewed at a national and at regional level to ensure that it is consistent. So at the moment, the Regional Assembly are looking at our draft. Uh, the Office of the Planning Regulator in Dublin are looking at our draft. The Minister and the Department, as well as a whole raft of other government agencies are going through our draft to make sure that it lines up with national and regional policy. But at the same time, you know, there has to be enough room and flexibility in it that you know, we can reflect local priorities as well. Um, the plan has to be evidence-based, uh, it has to anticipate the future needs of all groups within society, it should be a catalyst for positive change, and it should ensure protection of the environment and heritage. Um, in making the development plan, um, we have to have regard to its implement implementability. Um, we are obliged, uh, like every local authority is, uh, to seek to ensure, the, to deliver on all of the objectives in our development plan. So, you know, 
um, it's something that uh, we've got to take seriously. It's not an aspiration. It's not a document. Uh, like a lot of strategies and documents can sometimes be, uh, you know, books on a shelf. Uh, we refer to this um, a dozen times a day, every day. Every time we look at a planning application, we reference the development plan. Every time we make a grant application, we reference the development plan. And the policies and objectives in there, we are bound to try and deliver on those. And we will be held to account if we don't. Uh, we've got to do a two-year review uh, after the plan is adopted to see how much success we've had. And then two years later, we immediately begin this two-year cycle, this process of reviewing and, and replacing the plan. So it's a two-year rolling cycle. It just goes on and on and on. We've been paused for a number of years because of the NPF and the RSES. Uh, but now that our cycle has started up again, you know, this is this will be ongoing. Every two years, we'll either be adopting a plan, um, measuring and assessing our success in relation to the plan, or commencing the process of preparing a new one. Um, the layout and content is largely dictated by the legislation. Uh, the legislation tells us what we have to include in the development plan, and there are a whole lot of mandatory areas that have to be covered, things like climate change, natural amenities, land use, zoning, urban renewal, rights of way, travel or accommodation. They have to be dealt with in the plan. And as I say, if we don't cover those areas, uh, the minister, the department, the OPR, the, the OPR is the Office of the Planning Regulator, they will pull us up and they will tell us, look, there's a gap there, there's a hole there that needs to be plugged. Um, so we'll cover all of those areas, but um, the list is not exhaustive. We'll obviously go way beyond that. Um, you know, we will cover many, many more areas than are listed on that list there, but those are the things that we absolutely have to cover. Um, as I say, it's evidence-based. It's based on information that has been gathered by um, agencies such as the CSO through the census. Uh, we have quarterly household returns. We have employment figures, unemployment figures, uh, income figures. Uh, we've commissioned um, AERO, which is a unit in Maynooth University, uh, to do some uh, statistical analysis, demographic analysis on our behalf. They've mapped it. We're looking at uh, travel patterns, travel to work patterns, household formation patterns, house types, um, socioeconomics, um, you know, anything that is relevant, I suppose, to how people live, travel, work. And uh, again, you know, to allow us to assess their housing needs, their family formation, their family makeup, so that we can ensure that there is sufficient housing stock uh, to meet those demands. Uh, the process, as I say, is set out in the legislation. Uh, there are five steps. The first step is the preliminary step where we do our analysis. Uh, we speak with the councillors. We do our strategic environmental assessment scoping, and we draft up an issues paper, and we start a consultation. So that first stage is done. We moved on to the second stage, which is the preliminary public consultation. We put an issues paper out on display. We had a series of events such as this. Um, we did radio pieces, we did newspaper pieces, um, we spoke to a lot of stakeholders, a lot of agencies, and at the end of that then we had uh, a lot of submissions, I think it was about 285 submissions in total, some very detailed, some quite short, and what happens with those submissions, again, is the very same as what will happen to submissions received this time round, is all of those submissions um, they are compiled into what's called a chief executive's report. We list all the names of all of the people and all the agencies that made submissions during the public consultation period. We list all the issues that were raised uh, in those submissions. And then the chief executive has to go down through each one of those issues and make a specific comment in relation to each. And then that report goes to the elected members. So the members then are fully briefed as to uh, all of the, the comments that were received. Um, they consider that over a series of meetings and then the members issue a direction to the chief executive, which is, you know, we hear what you're saying, um, we've gone through the submissions, this is what we want to see in our development plan. And then the task is passed to the executive to, I suppose, commence drafting the plan. So we work with the members over a long series of meetings, workshops, um, uh, the, the draft goes, the text goes backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards until such time as the committees of the council, uh, the area committees, the strategic planning committee and the council as a whole are satisfied with the text and when they are satisfied uh, it goes on public display. So that's the text now which is on display. It's been, uh, it's been approved by the members to go on public display. Not all the members will be happy with everything that's in it, but they were happy to, for it to go on display as a draft, uh, as a public consultation exercise. 
it will undoubtedly change. Um, you know, the emphasis is on the word draft. It's a working document. Um, you know, this uh, public consultation exercise, uh, if it's to mean anything, uh, you know, it has to result in some change to the draft. You know, we're not doing this just for uh, for show. You know, th th this consultation uh, will have to be reported back to the members. All of the submissions that have been received will have to be reported back to the members. And, you know, that will result in significant changes um, to the draft. And if there are changes made, which undoubtedly there will be, we move to that uh, second to last stage on the page there, which is public consultation. That's the third round of public consultation. Any changes that have been made to the draft will be notified to you through the newspapers, through this website, through the portal. And again, we'll have another round of public consultation before again, the members meet uh, to consider uh, whether or not to adopt the plan with or without those amendments. So the whole process, about two years from start to finish, but we're well advanced. Uh, we've cleared the first two stages. We're well advanced on the, the third stage. So uh, once this consultation is over, we'll start making those changes and uh, we'll be back to you again early next year with those changes for your consideration. Um, the consultation documentation, as Vanessa said at the outset, is all available on our portal, consult.waterfordcouncil.ie, which I'm sure most of you have probably found now at this stage, and that's maybe how you found your way here this evening. Um, that and Marcus will run through that in some detail uh, in, in a few minutes. He, you know, he'll just tell you how to access the maps, how to access the documentation. But what I would say is um, have a look at that and start working up a submission if you want to have your views considered by the members of the council. And, you know, these conversations are very useful. Um, you know, this is, um, this is an information session. Um, but the submissions that the members will be considering, the submissions that the chief executive will be commenting on, are written submissions that are received uh, during the consultation period. So you've got from now until the end of August to get your submissions into us. And um, every and all submission that comes into us will be read, will be reviewed, will be commented on, and will be fed back to the members. Um, so, as I said, the, the opportunity is there for, for everybody to get involved, and I hope as many of you as possible do. Um, that's as much as I want to say for the moment. Uh, we're here for um, from now until um, about half past eight, and you know, just keep your questions coming, and we'll try and answer them as best we can. That's great, Liam. Uh, thank you very much for that. It was a very uh, clear overview, and particularly on, on how submissions are considered and responded to. And just on that, you'll be able to find the Chief Executive's report at the issue stage on the consultation portal if you would like to, to um, consult that, so to see how the earlier submissions to the earlier stage were responded to. Um, if you have any questions on Liam's presentation in terms of the process, please do put them into the chat and uh, Liam will start responding to those already and we'll pick those up again later on. And just to mention that the closing date is the 30th of August at 5 p.m. So I see Hugh, um, your slides are there now, so I'll hand over to you. And I understand that Hugh, your video may be off because, you're, um, because of your uh, connection. So over to you, Hugh, thanks very much. Um, thanks, Mr. and thanks, Liam. Yeah, I'm just going to, uh, we had one or two glitches last night um, with uh, poor connections and I've had one or two warnings um, since we came on here this evening. So I'm just going to turn the video off and um, talk in the background, but um, uh, it won't distract you from, uh, I suppose, the detail, hopefully. Um, yeah, so I, I suppose, as Liam said, you know, um, the plan is a, is a strategic document. Um, and it's it's our uh, it's our I suppose first um, attempt uh, in terms of of uh, I suppose transposing maybe the, the the policies and objectives of of the, both the national uh, planning framework and the regional spatial economic strategy to to the water context. So um, it's the first step in that. And as you said, there's there will be a more granular I suppose step at looking at local area plans um, uh, once we get our draft in place. Or sorry, once we get our, our final plan made this time next year. Um, and it's it's really you know the 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 the, the greater detail uh, around I suppose place making um, you know can come through through that that sort of that that that, that next uh, uh, I suppose consultation phase around our local area plans, or indeed um, uh, any uh, any um, uh, other non-statutory plans that we might look at doing either by you know just a framework plans or uh, maybe village design statements etc. So. Um, but in terms of tonight, I suppose what, what I'm just going to try and do is just explain a little bit about placemaking and, and our logic behind the, um, the, the policies and objectives we'd put forward in the draft plan. 
um, placemaking is, is something that doesn't, uh, it's a little bit like um, uh, climate change and um, uh, biodiversity and heritage. They don't, sometimes they don't fit neatly into one particular chapter. So, um, but a, a, in terms of, of the draft, most of the, the placemaking piece, um, you'll find in chapter eight uh, and um, in appendix two as well, which looks at some specific development objectives um, for different areas. Um, so I'd urge you to maybe to have a look at those. And uh, we, we're certainly um, part of the whole consultation process is trying to maybe uh, augment that appendix two in terms of what's, what's relevant to, to, to local areas. Um, so in terms of, I suppose, what, what underpins our, our place making, um, we, we've set out two, uh, two objectives, I suppose, strategic objectives, and they are to promote a, a diverse choice of places which are attractive, of high quality design centered on the human scale and accessible to all. Um, these will act as the heart of every community across Waterford City and County. Um, and this will be achieved through uh, a number of, of, of uh, I suppose, um, uh, different uh, uh, pieces and they are uh, strengthening sustainable connections between people and place, uh, promoting exemplar urban design, um, diversity of built form uh, uses and outdoor spaces resulting in positive social interactions, um, reduced carbon emissions and greater uh, opportunities for biodiversity. Um, so uh, as you read through and as I go through some of the slides later you'll see how, how those, those sort of strategic uh, objectives and, and aims um, uh, underpin the, the some of the more operational policy objectives. Um, the strategic policy, I suppose, looks at the, uh, again, um, I suppose, looks at, at a number of different issues. Um, uh, uh, again, through community engagement, uh, as I said already, it's, it's a very important element of this um, uh, in terms of the process um, uh, to develop a network of distinct places which are resilient, safe, attractive, adaptable and stimulating which promotes social, uh, sustainable transport modes, which are universally accessible and to all, and which enhance the opportunity for social interaction, which reflect and respect the diversity of each community. So a little bit, a little bit like uh, the, the, that first strategic aim, um, or ob objective, sorry. Um, develop a 10 minute city neighborhood concept. Um, again, something that's, that's where we, we have, um, I, I suppose, uh, taken on board from, from the, the regional uh, spatial economic strategy. Um, and it's it's a it's a, a national drive, I suppose, towards towards um, uh, looking at improving our places and and indeed uh, tackling climate change. Um, so the whole idea of you know having people close to places they need to be, um, and uh, both close in terms of time and spatially, I suppose, as much as possible. Um, so the ten minutes may not always be feasible, but you know the the, the fifteen minute, um, ten fifteen minutes, our concept should should in in most cases be uh, achievable. I think across most of our settlements uh, and our neighbourhoods in 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 Water City and in parts of Dungarvan as well. Um, enshrine place making in all developments to create socially sustainable communities and environments, and reflect and transcribe the relevant uh, national policy objectives and regi regional policy objectives. As I said already from the the uh, NPF, National Planning Framework, and the Regional Spatial Economic Strategy. And, and as Liam mentioned already as well, the Section 28 Ministerial Guidelines, um, which are relevant in terms of placemaking, such as the, the urban design pieces, the, um, the guidelines around um, building heights um, and uh, apartment design, et cetera. Um, and other, other best practice standards around placemaking, around permeability, around um, uh, urban roads and streets, um, and other sort of design principles around those. Um, so I suppose when we look at um, when we look at place, I suppose there there are two things. I suppose really um, uh, for the purpose of the evening, there there are two sort of elements to it. The, one is the the hierarchy of places um, themselves within and across our settlements, and and the other piece which I might just touch on is is just the, the hierarchy of settlements themselves across Waterford and and in particular Dungarvan is more um, municipal district. So. Um, firstly, I suppose when, when we look at, at any, any place, um, uh, you know, we, we, the, we, we consider that it's, it's um, I suppose it's, a, it's, it's a, an agglomeration of a lot of different pieces um, and a lot of different elements and, and those are sort of set out in that, in that wheel. So there's the whole idea of health and well-being, how, how sociable a place is, what the environment is like, um, the sort of commercial mix, the, the justice um, elements of it as to the services there. Um, how productive it is in terms of, of, of its uses um, and the networks um, uh, that, that sort of um, that connected with elsewhere and, and that link it internally and externally and, and then the, the skills level that might be uh, in terms of services that might be achievable and, and I suppose when you look at every settlement um, and I'll just go through the hierarchy in, in, in just in a little bit 
um, uh, I suppose there are different sizes, you know, so so that wheel, I suppose, sort of demonstrates to some extent their thinking in terms of, of um, looking at the city, what, what, what sort of services and what sort of um, uh, places we need to create uh, and what the elements of those would be. Uh, in, in our cities uh, on the on the outer ring of that wheel and and uh, as we go to the center then I suppose we move to the smaller settlements and rural areas as to you know what what we can realistically achieve um, and provide in, in those so I think it's just it's, it's a good way I think of measuring what's achievable and and um, I suppose um, being realistic about 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 um, the outcomes uh, of any plan or project program or project um, uh, in terms of Dungavan and Lismore, in terms of the hierarchy, um, our core strategy has set out, um, I suppose, our thinking around that. Um, and to a certain extent, it has uh, the core strategy and the, the settlement hierarchy and typology we, we've put forward um, reflects, I suppose, what was in the, what was in the two previous um, county development plans um, and has sort of brought in uh, the element of that key town. Um, which is part of the uh, typology uh, uh, put forward in the region spatial economic strategy. So, so what we've done is we've we've identified Dungarvan uh, uh, and Ballinode as the key town. Um, so that the synergies between those two settlements are important. Um, they're they're independent but but symbiotic, I suppose, uh, to some extent. Um, so uh, uh, and uh, as I said, the the region spatial economic strategy has identified Dungarvan as a key town um, uh, to to a lesser extent, I suppose, in in terms of the, the the draft plan um it, the RSAS has also um identified Clamel as a key town but uh, we have a little piece of that I suppose in our administrative area so we're we're playing a part in relation to that but I suppose for West Waterford Dungarvan is where it's at um in terms of the the key uh, uh, urban function um but as you can see there that, that that's just a, a screen grab from one of the maps in the core strategy um but it, it what what we have done is identified spatially though that hierarchy of places really uh, in terms of settlements, so um, we look at the the key towns, the 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 larger urban towns, um, for instance, like um, uh, I suppose uh, in 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 the Dungarvan is more area. You're looking at at, at Capaquin and Tallow. Um, at the look at the smaller rural towns, then like Ardmore, the Gwaith Loch Nation, including Shana Fubble, and um, yeah, uh, I suppose those those rural villages like Aglish, Ballyduffupper, Ballymacarbury, Clashmore, Tournille, Villiers Town, those. Pieces and then we've brought back in um, what, uh, a number of small uh, rural clusters, which, which were in the the not the the current uh, county plan, but the previous one. So that's looking at sort of you know what what the function and role of uh, of uh, of the likes of Grange, Knockanore, Mellory, uh, Modelago, Piltown, those these kind of places. What 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 their role and function can be, and what we can support in terms of of uh, their. I suppose their function uh, during the life of the, the the next development plan to 2028, um, and, and in addition to that, I suppose we've we've identified two cluster areas really I suppose relevant to Dungarvan is more, um, and there um, there's I suppose cluster areas around uh, the Blackwater Valley and and the Gwaeltacht, um, looking at the economic and and community function of those um, and how we can maybe. How we can uh, maybe look uh, more holistically at, at bringing the, the the roles and functions of the different settlements in those um, uh, areas together to to I suppose to to um, to build on their strengths and their opportunities to so that collectively they 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 work um, more effectively than if they're if they're um, maybe doing their own thing in an independent fashion. So I think it's, you know, again it's that sort of a very quick overview of of. Um, uh, that that sort of typology and hierarchy that as it as it is relevant to Dungarvan is more, um, and and I suppose particularly for Dungarvan and is more um, uh, for Dungarvan and Ballon Road as a key town, I suppose the, the the main I suppose the two real real points I suppose that we, we we've tried to highlight um, in the plan and if you look at the land use zoning uh, or the proposed land use zoning you, you might you'll see this reflected that um, uh, really did. Two sort of two main elements of it is the the provision of lands for new residential development, uh, and that seeks to consolidate the existing residential areas close to the historic core of Dungarvan during the life of the proposed draft. Um, there has been, I suppose, a a, a growth and a spread of Dungarvan uh, uh, eastwards, um, uh, and it's something that I suppose uh, we feel, and um, I think uh, the the regional and national policy would suggest also that um, that that. I suppose ultimately isn't isn't good in terms of um, I suppose in terms of uh, linking people with place and making uh, making settlements more sustainable, and then I suppose the longer term objective will be to to further consolidate around the town, 
um, east of the Colligan River, um, closer to its historic footprint, uh, to further support the concept of, of compact and sequential growth. So they're, they're important concepts that, that underpin place, and, and we'll touch on those in a bit as well. Um, just um, you know, looking at a town centre uh, or, or village centre as the case may be approach to, to um, developing uh, uh, key sites and then looking at, at trying to make those areas more compact, um, more accessible, more permeable and um, indeed uh, I suppose better places to live and, and more convenient places to live. Um, so in terms of the, the policy objectives, the sort of operational policy objectives that we set out in Chapter 8, there are sort of four principles that underpin those. Um, and the policies are sort of a, a, a aligned around those, um, and they're they're really the the as you can see, it's just another I suppose another wheel uh, uh, diagram there. But um, looking at at places in particular in terms of their sociability, um, uh, looking at uh, their uses and activities, looking at their, their how, how comfortable they are and how they feel and how they look, I suppose, um, and looking at access and linkages. So it's a little bit like the. The other um, wheel that I, I I had up earlier, but it's it's kind of this this is the this is the core of, of what we're trying to achieve in terms of of, of place making in in essence. Um, so if we look at at uh, the the first one of those, I suppose access and connectivity and linkages, um, our policy objectives seek to prioritise safe, convenient alternatives to the private car. Um, try to uh, looking at integrating age cohorts into public spaces. Um, uh, particularly given, um, I suppose, our, our aging population and our demographic um, profiles, generally speaking. Um, uh, looking at universal design across the public realm, uh, particularly for uh, ensuring that, uh, I suppose, that that um, uh, that the design of, of these public spaces and buildings uh, is, is appropriate for, for that aging cohort. Um, uh, looking at a hierarchy of streets and places to promote legibility and permeability. So looking at how we can how we can make places sort of more legible um, so that people can sort of, you know, to a certain extent, uh, follow your instinct or um, uh, uh, maybe, you know, it's like it's like any anything that is it's, it's more user friendly, I suppose, if, if that's the term. Um, looking at uh, RPO 176, as I said earlier, that 10 minute neighborhood concept. Um, uh, I suppose that transcends um, uh, everything really that uh, uh, everything that we're trying to achieve in these policies uh, policy objectives is to is to um, is to get to that sort of uh, 10 minute neighborhood concept and that's not that's not um, that's not only in, in terms of new neighborhoods but I think it's important that we we try and achieve that in terms of existing or older neighborhoods um, we all know the the sort of um, areas where where we have to maybe take circuitous walks or uh, it's easier to get into the car and drive to the shop rather than than walk across um, a, a piece of open space and maybe try to, um, you know, uh, without without any impeding uh, sort of barriers. So you know, linking uh, linking um, I suppose cul-de-sacs or linking um, housing schemes in an appropriate way so that they don't uh, generate um, uh, antisocial behaviour. They're they're all very important um, things that we need to tackle. Um, uh, you know, in essence, um, they're not going to be achievable in, in every instance, but I think, um, you know, they're, uh, I think the communities um, and the, the consultation piece around all those will be very important um, to ensure that, uh, you know, that we move, um, we move in, in terms of the retrospective permeability in, in small steps. Um, but again, you know, it's, we, we have to get into that space, um, looking at places and buildings uh, to be welcoming to all. Um, in terms of principle number two, um, looking just just looking at image, comfort, and safety. Um, again, picking up on that welcoming piece. Um, again, they need to be compact, uh, high quality designs to support local public transport and services. Again, um, that that public transport is is key to um, making those places more sustainable and more attractive uh, uh, and more accessible. Um, incorporation of natural environment. Um, uh, looking at uh, climate um, orientation and uh, built features, um, the architecture of an area that, that may be particular um, to, to generating um, or to enhancing its, its character. Um, it's very important, I suppose, that we don't take a, a, a sort of a, a standard palette of um, tools um, uh, and, and apply them uh, evenly across uh, or equally across Waterford City and across Dungarvan and across, uh, you know, um, Kilmac Thomas or uh, Capaquin or Tallow or anywhere. Um, uh, well, I think we need to be we need to be very cognizant of of the existing um, uh, character of, of a particular area and reflect that. I think in in terms of of the design of public spaces and and developments going forward. Um, and and a requirement then for for design statements uh, to to support that I suppose 
Um, so, for instance, um, uh, you know, proposals for 15 houses or more um, or commercial units uh, of or commercial developments of over uh, 500 square metres need to be accompanied by um, design statements which aren't um, which aren't generic um, and which which uh, are, are founded on on um, you know a, a significant and and robust um, uh, assessment of the local um, local context in terms of the built and natural environment and and seek to uh, augment that and improve it. Um, uh, principle number three, then looking at sus uh, sustainable, attractive, and multifunctional spaces um, or multifunctionality. Um, so uh, I, I suppose when you think of something that's sustainable and attractive, um, I suppose, and, and the multifunctionality of, of uh, blue green infrastructure and nature based solutions, I think um, they're, they're key to this. Um, so looking at, at ideas like sustainable urban drainage systems. Um, uh, for instance, um, I suppose, you know, providing providing um, surface swales maybe and surface ponds for for um, uh, surface water attenuation rather than, you know, building a tank and stink it, sticking it in the ground um, and covering it over with sort of monocultural grass. I think we need to move away from that and start looking a little bit more inventively at the solutions we bring through, um, uh, uh, you know, those nature based solutions are, are are, are a positive that can add to uh, the immunity uh, and the biodiversity of any place. Um, and that's also, I suppose, for our smaller settlements in, in some instances where we where we need to um, augment um, uh, maybe uh, um, wastewater treatment um, to um, integrate constructed wetlands or, you know, again, we all we all know that the the, um, the example of Dunhill um, as, as I suppose one of the, 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 the greater successes in that regard. And, the, you know, it's not just is taking the that um, infrastructure piece and, and making it into an amenity and a, and, a, and a significant biodiversity gain for the area. So you know, looking at all those possibilities, um, passive and active spaces and and how we interact with them or, or how we sorry how we integrate them, um, retaining existing natural features and assets as I said earlier, um, uh, uh, looking at the mix of uses to encourage social interaction and integration, um, uh, looking at housing mix uh, and tenure type. Uh, um, very important, I suppose, in terms of, I suppose, the the the, the profile and the demography of 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 um, what uh, residents um, can be accommodated in any particular uh, location. Um, looking at higher density um, uh, in certain locations, um, particularly around high quality um, and high capacity transport modes or nodes, um, and those need to be accompanied by a higher design input. Um, and looking at neighbourhoods and settlement centres to be des destinations in their own right. So I think it's, you know, it, it's, it's sort of building the profile of these areas um, in, in a realistic sort of manner. Um, so and finally, principle number four, looking at sociability and inclusivity, um, spaces and buildings to support that social interaction, um, balance the need for both privacy and security across space and, and their functions. So, you know, to ensure that um, particularly for the likes of those permeability um, uh, linkages to ensure that they're passively supervised and that there's there's adequate sort of uh, activity and movement through those to ensure that they don't become um, antisocial behaviour um, problems into the future. Um, from our from our own perspective as a local authority, um, the, uh, our project focus, I suppose, looking at uh, rural uh, regeneration development fund, the urban uh, regeneration development fund, and other sort of European um, uh, uh, programs and projects like Orbact and the Green Deal. Um, looking at how we can sort of um, maybe bring those on board uh, in terms of, of a, a, you know, building that inclusivity and sociability and then collaboration, as I said, with local communities and, and the users of spaces. Um, uh, I think we, we keep saying um, uh, that, you know, that that, that, that that consultation piece is vitally important. I think, um, you know, to, to a certain extent, um, you know, when you when people talk about doing local area plans or you know village design statements, it's it's great at the end of the day you have um, a, a, a document, a statutory or, or otherwise that that you can use in in as a tool, I suppose, to manage development. But but I think it's very important. I think also that not not to forget that the um, the, the 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 process whereby um, we we generate those documents um, uh, in, in a collaborative way with local communities between ourselves and and the local communities and other interest groups is very important. That 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 builds. Um, you know, uh, uh, I suppose trust and relationships, and, and it, it enhances, I suppose, the outcome of, of, of these processes. Um, so that 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 that's very important, and, and it's one of the essential elements. And you know, if it, I suppose ten years ago, if you're talking to somebody about placemaking, it would be you know it would be a, a dialogue around um, landscape and architecture. Um, 
uh, you know, today um, that collaboration and that community engagement is 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 front and center. I think in terms of of um, you know the importance of of making places for communities, not just making places because you think they're nice. Um, so thanks for for listening. Um, and as we've said already, look, have your say and registering and consult uh, waterforcouncil.ie and make that submission. Um, as Liam said, you know we we have a bit of time, or you have a bit of time to do that uh, until the the end of next month, the thirtieth. Um, so um, I suppose the sooner you sort of get pen to paper, um, uh, the sooner we can. Uh, the, well, it's it's important, I suppose, to that you can build that. Um, you can build the, um, the the submission as you go over the next month. So um, you know there's no rush in doing it yet. But uh, if you can make the start, you can. As I said, you can you can build on it as as time allows over the next bit of time. Okay, thanks. Um, thanks very much, Hugh. Um, that's great um, and very clear. And thanks to everyone who has put in questions so far. I can see that uh, Liam there is getting back on some of those, and we're going to pick up on those questions in our discussion, which will start very shortly and just after Marcus's final presentation. And Marcus is going to outline how to use the consultation portal, how to engage with the material um, as you prepare to make your submission. So, Marcus, over to you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'll quickly take you through uh, our consultation portal and then we'll move on to questions uh, and answers in a while. OK, so um, this is our consultation portal for the plan. Some of you might have looked at it already and had a quick look. Um, basically, <coughs> sorry, I'll just put that away. So once you go into the, I suppose, into your Google or whatever, you put in consultwaterford.ie and this will bring you to your homepage or alternatively, you can be navigated to from our own um, city and county council website. Um, on the homepage itself, this is where you register as a new user. And as Hugh was saying, that's where you, once you register, you can, you know, uh, make your submission. Um, as you as you go along, you can build your submission. So we, we would encourage you to do that. Um, once you get into this page here, I have a few tabs open at the top just um, to avoid any problems with the Wi-Fi. So I just click to those. But you you know you you click in this icon basically, and this will bring you into our, our next page, our menu page, and um, where all the contents of the plan are found. Um, so just on the left hand side here is a bit of information about the I suppose the consultation process itself. Um, you know, it's on public display till the 30th of August. We'd be taking submissions up until that time, and where it's on public display. Um, how you can have your say um, as well. So, you know, as I said, we'd encourage you to use the portal um, to make your submission or alternatively, um, we will accept them in writing and, and then we will upload them to the portal ourselves. Um, uploading them to the portal is important because it helps us to kind of collate the information and tag the different themes and, you know, run various reports. Um, so we know, you know, what are the, the really particular areas people are, are mostly concerned with. Um, as you scroll on in, there is a little video here um, how to make your online submission. So there's a, a seven minute video that will talk you through every step of the way. So it's very, um, it's a very simple kind of a way to to make your submission. Um, and the, the, the portal is very interactive. So again, you can just see here that we would have already the submissions that have been received and we have moderated those um, 70 submissions. So if there's something that you want to maybe have a look at, see what's already been sent in and see is it kind of on similar lines to your own that maybe you could, you know, take inspiration from or back up or whatever way. So you just click on this and the icon here. So that will bring you through the, the various submissions that are already there. So you can, you know, you can click into those um, and read them, see exactly what they're about. So, um, you know, we have 17 submissions ranging on various items. And um, again, they can be all viewed in this little dashboard we have here. So it's a new way of I suppose presenting the information to you um, so you can see you know there's all these if like on volume one there's up four observations there on that and one observation on the Watford city so it's it's a, you know it's real it's a great way of presenting things now um, you know so you can just see that the level of interest so settlement and zoning of four and four um, submissions there at, at the moment but you know we'd be expecting many many more submissions and again there's there's a tool that you can, you know, draw on a map and upload it as well. So that would that would come in here. So um, there's, you know, we'd kind of encourage you to have a have a look and maybe have a have a little poke around and, and see how you get on. Again, if you have any issues on, you know, if you're kind of stuck anywhere, you can ring us up, email us, and uh, you know, we'd be happy to talk you through it. 
So I'll just skip on to the next part of it, which is, you know, the plan itself and where it is. So I suppose the plan itself is divided into four volumes, uh, volume one, two, three and four, and then there's the environmental report. So volume one um, is set out in three parts, our vision and strategy, the Waterford City and maps, mass strategy, and then the rest of the city and county policy objectives. So, you know, there's all the different chapters of the plan. Um, volume two is the development management standards here. Um, so you can just click into that or any of these, download them and have a read of them. Um, the volume two is our development management standards. That's kind of the, I suppose, the rule book against which um, most, or sorry, all uh, development is kind of assessed. So I mean, it would have your various standards from, you know, sight lines to car parking standards to, you know, design of rural houses, whatever it may be. Um, volume three would be a list of all of your appendices. Um, so we have 20 appendices. So if there's anything you're, you know, you've particular interest in, you just click in and you download. So say, for example, um, as you know, he was talking tonight, it was, you know, place making chapter eight. So you have, you know, you've, you found that here, chapter eight, and you've clicked into it. And this will give you a brief overview of the section. And again, as you scroll down, you can just download it here. Again, same, similar for appendix two, which is, you know, specific development objectives. Um, you know, these are found here. So you just click in and it will give you you know, you can download a table of all the specific development objectives. And again, as you move on, we have these um, represented in, um, in our map formats, which I'll talk through in one second. Um, just once I finish off your appendices. So, you know, there's there's the full list. Um, whether is that, if there's anything particular you, you have interested in. Um, we've separated out some of the environmental reports down here because they're quite, uh, I suppose they're quite heavy in terms of, you know, downloading and they're quite big documents. So that's our strategic flood risk assessment, um, our SCA, strategic environmental assessment and our appropriate assessment document. Um, again, they can be all just downloaded. So now I'll take you just through the mapping that we've produced um, quickly. So they, that's all, all in here. So there's six different categories of maps um, and within those different categories there's various different maps so if, say for example if you're looking at you know settlement and zoning is where you're, you're interested in so you click on that and that will show your settlement hierarchy or boundaries land use zoning and specific development objectives so you just click here to view that map <coughs> excuse me and that will bring you through to all these story maps here so i just i suppose quickly run down through it. So as Hugh was mentioning earlier on, this is our settlement hierarchy from our core strategy. And um, your, you know, um, your whatever city, your city metro area, then your key towns of Dungarvan and Clamel and your large urban towns as you kind of scroll down along, you can see the see those and click into your own relevant area. And um, then I suppose for the more lower tier settlements we've done is we've identified a settlement boundary. Um, sorry, it doesn't seem to be loading up for some reason. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so we you draw, um, I suppose, a built envelope around these kind of smaller settlements, which identify, um, you know, wh where we where we see development to be, you know, targeted rather than you know specifically zoning every patch of ground. It kind of gives it more flexibility, um, that we can you know look at various different uses in, in maybe different areas, and that's assessed against your development management standards, um. And that's also gives some of your functions that are in those areas as well. So there's just an example of Strandbley. Um, here's Tallow. Um, and again, uh, it says, look, I suppose that all development will be, you know, I'll have regard to policy um, CS16, a development plan, um, which is just, you know, related to smaller towns and villages and, you know, what type of development we'd like to see in those areas. Um, so again, it's just a quick overview of this. So our zoning and flood mapping then, these are for larger settlements. Um, again, you can pull this map to, you know, whatever settlement you're looking for, if it's in the city or as I said, look, I suppose we're talking maybe more Dungarvan here tonight. So you can zoom in, zoom out, and if there's any particular site you're, you're interested in, you just pull the map and I don't know, we'll just click here randomly and, you know, this is an existing residential area in Dungarvan. <clears throat> so, you know, we'll just scroll down a little bit further. So that's our draft land use zoning map. Yeah, you know, so quickly move along. Then our flood mapping is overlaid on top of that. And um, so if there's any areas that will, you know, that will be maybe at risk of flood, um, you know, um, I suppose those areas identified and what we would kind of um, see as compatible uses in those areas or not compatible uses as well. And um, flood zones A and B. 
So as I mentioned earlier on, the next map down is your specific development objectives. So here is just an example of Ardmore. Again, the map can be pulled to you know zoom in, zoom out to wherever you are. So you can click on any of these specific ones and it'll tell you the objective for the area. So here is just um, uh, an objective to encourage development of new enterprise employment uh, of a smaller scale in Ardmore. So again, you know, it's all it's all there for you to have a look at and to mess around with. And again, we have at the end a combined map. So say for example, if you're interested in was I'll just quickly run through our next one was would be mapping would be maybe a transport map. And then I've built heritage just pulled up here as well. So I'll just do transport very, very quickly. Um, so again, this gives us our transport objectives. Um, it focuses on the city, I suppose, by default, this map does, but again, it's pulled to, you know, it can be pulled all over the county and zoomed in, zoom out. Um, and again, it gives the, I suppose, sorry, just here, the information, the transport objectives along with the wider rail network that services the city. Um, and the next kind of layer up or layered off, and that is recreational routes that we've identified in around the city. Um, and again, as I said, look, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's county wide. Um, next map, there's Waterford Airport mapping, or again, there's kind of combined, um, sorry, there's maps here of the airport, you can see, and then there's a combined transport map at the end of everything. Um, or if you're example, say you want to look at, you know, the built heritage in a particular area, um, protected structures, things like that. So I mean, we have maps of, you know, what's being added to the protected structures list, additions to it. So that's all over the county. You can see those, so you can click on any of those and see what they are. Um, additions to the architectural conservation areas you can see as well. Um, there's um, built heritage data as well, monuments are there. Um, and again, at the end, there's a, I suppose, a combined map here of kind of all the information built together. So let that let me just come up for you. That's just focused in on Tremor. So you can see, you know, all the, the heritage, um, you know, issues that pertain to that area. Um, so again, that's just kind of a very quick kind of a, a run through of the of the portal. Look, I know it's a lot to, to kind of take in in you know five or ten minutes or whatever it is, but um, you know once you get in and have a have a look at it, you can you know figure out what kind of what your, your area of concern is, and we encourage everybody to make the submission as we'd said, um, or submission date is to the thirtieth of August. Um, so as you said, you know you can build on build on your submission and. You know, have, a, have a think about it but um, it's very important i suppose because all the submissions we receive would feed through to the chief executive support which goes into the council chamber and um you know it, it's, it's your chance to kind of make the plan your plan and um, have your voice heard um in the process so um with that i'll hand back over to uh, vanessa and we'll open the floor for questions and answers thanks very much that's great thanks very much marcus um and for all of those uh, three presentations it's almost eight o'clock now, um, and so we'll just kick off with our uh, discussion. Um, and I see there's an, a number of questions in, uh, which we have to get through in, in a short period of time. So what we'll try to do is, um, if the planning team could come in just on, on each question um, as it does, and I'm going to call first on Alan. Um, I see, Alan, you have a number of questions there related to a climate change, and particularly um, urban heating. And you also touch on the idea of, I suppose, embedded carbon in buildings and asking about uh, whether there will be um, a climate change officer and an interesting response there related to the setup of a climate change office. So I look forward to hearing about that. Alan, would you like to come in there with your question? Thanks, Vanessa. Um, I mean, I've mentioned, I've probably mentioned every evening I've been on, um, but I was just thinking about it uh, after last night's discussion, particularly and thinking, um, you know, uh, Hugh and Liam were saying correctly, you know, the sustainability and so on is right through the document. And Hugh was saying yesterday that there's lots of legislation, national legislation that backs it up and so on. But I just think the challenge is absolutely massive. And I think that, I mean, just things, things like our roadways and that we use tarmac and it's hugely carbon producing and our buildings, we use concrete and I live in a concrete house myself and concrete is hugely uh, carbon producing. And these are absolutely massive challenges. Um, and so um, as we develop the county over the next six years, what do we do about that? Because I'd also put in there in one of my comments that 
they're talking about uh, the experts are talking about uh, we'll be at a two degree increase in global temperature in 14 years time. So after a six year development plan, there'll only be eight years left before that happens. And that's going to lead to a crop disaster across the planet. So like it's really, really serious. But I um, and I know my own, my own children are in their late 30s and 40s and they're saying, God, we're done for. So, um, and I know other young people, obviously, we all know about Greta Thunberg, Thunberg and what she's saying. So it's, it's like it really needs, in this development plan, it really needs to be a priority. It needs to be right front. It needs to be in the centre. It needs to be at the end of it. It needs to be like, what are we going to do about this? Because for ourselves, I probably won't be around, but... Um, but for our children, um, and for those of you here who are younger than me, like for yourselves, this is this is massive. Um, and the last thing I was delighted to hear you saying, Hugh saying last night that the population uh, suggestions by the uh, National Planning Credit, whatever they're called, um, haven't been reached because the last thing actually we need in any country or any part of Ireland, any part of the world is growth. And so there's a huge, there's always a huge push for growth for obvious reasons, but from a climate change point of view, it's the absolutely last thing we need. So that's why I mentioned, it wasn't so much an office, but is there a working group of experts that can inform, that Waterford County Council can pull together and inform this document, uh, this development plan? Because it really, really needs to be strongly informed, and I'm not taking from any of the expertise in the planning office. And maybe the experts are there, but if they're not, or if they need uh, a strengthening of their argument for this, uh, I'd please, please get, them, please, please do it. Thanks, Alan. Um, yeah, I suppose I, I don't know how I can answer that. There's, uh, you know, there, there isn't an answer to that. I think no. But but uh, I think I think um, you know when when we think of, when you think of what the development plan is, you know, it's 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 a document that tries to manage the spatial um, growth or otherwise of, of an area. Um, and what we have done, I suppose, is what we or what we what we think or what we what we hope we certainly have done um, uh, to to a level that I suppose. Um, and given the unknown, the climate change, you know, the, 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 there's always an unknown or an element of that. Um, but you know, we have looked at we have looked at our uh, uh, reviewed our, our flooding areas um, uh, for the purposes of this plan. We've looked at we've taken on board, I suppose, a lot of concerns, um, and our SEA has brought forward, um, I suppose, uh, the, the idea of, of um, I suppose, waste management, um, and that, I suppose, to some extent, is puts a little bit of pressure on on developers to to reduce waste um, in 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 their uh, activities um, and that's that's not a that's not a small thing um, we're, we're looking at um, you know we, we've included uh, policy objectives to ensure that you know that that we do consider that embodied energy um, uh, and if somebody is coming to look at, at, at proposing a proposed development that we are we are we are promoting, um, and we will you know we're we're suggesting to to a certain extent that um, that building should be retained. Um, you know, in all circumstances, that may not be possible mm. um, because some buildings may not be safe. Um, yeah. Was those sort of issues? But I think, and, and I think one one of the big policies, and and um, uh, uh, I think it's 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 uh, it's like you know the, the whole this uh, this whole beta project idea of of test beds and trying something out first before you roll it out. I think you know the the the, the identification of Waterford City as a decarbonizing zone, the entire city is is a huge step, um, yeah. and it's going to take an absolute bucket load of money to try and deliver it. And it's going to take a, a bucket load of effort between the public and the private sector and residents and everything. And I think there was, I saw some some. Um, uh, so just some of the other texts there or some of the other messages or, or questions around um, you know micro generation and uh, district heating and all these issues like that there these are just such such huge issues that we need to try and tackle um, um, but uh, I think you know as I said in, in one of those responses you know that there, that, that that climate we, we have our climate action um, uh, 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 our own climate um, uh, and, and action in, in relation to the council and we are promoting, I suppose, our own buildings and and trying to uh, manage the energy demand in them um, uh, to make them more sustainable. So I don't while you know while we I think that the the promotion um, 
Well, I think I think the the the, the big thing about renewables and um, you know micro generation is 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 to 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 the to the um, to the project proponent is going to be um, the cost and and the return. Um, so on, on such time as technology, I suppose, becomes more cheaper, um, and the return maybe in terms of of feed-in tariffs becomes attractive. Um, I think it's going to be difficult maybe to get um, everybody moving in that direction. But I think you know. I think it, it's something that outside the outside the, the the our capacity. I think to to drive change. I think we can we can uh, you know if if we can get um if we can tackle the the the, the city as as a decarbonizing zone and and, get, and reach those targets um uh, um that we set out in the plan. Well, then that's I think we'll be we'll be we'll be a long way ahead. And if everybody else is the same, we'd be we certainly be we we certainly be uh, improving our lot. But, I, I agree. There's the you know every time you you read you read the social media or you read you pick up the the the, the papers or or any other um, uh, um, uh, news feed um, you know they're uh, you know every summer you know the the articles are are more more pronounced uh, mm. in terms of the impacts of climate change. So yeah, we we, we need we need to do something. Um, but uh, as I said, you know if if we look at how we spatially arrange ourselves. Um, um, and that's, I suppose, one of the core, our core, the core of our core strategy. Is, as I mentioned, some of the, the evenings was was built, you know, how how we how we um, you know bring bring uh, how we how we affect climate change um, and reduce carbon emissions through um, the location layout and design of development. That's what we're trying to do. Mm. You know, and, and if yeah. I think we, we can we we we've identified a lot of of uh, pieces that we can do around that. Um, there, there may be more, but again, you know, I, I think we have to be realistic in terms of what a development plan is um, and what it can achieve. Mm. Thanks. Right. Thanks, Alan, for that. Um, Chris Dore, you have two questions there related to town centre first uh, approach to development and also to retrofitting um, housing estates and car centric developments for permeability. Would you like to come in on those? Thanks very much. Now I did get some uh, feedback in the in the chat as we were going along, but I suppose that the, the overall point I wanted to ask in relation to is in, in relation to transport, and I suppose achieving a, a modal shift away from from car based transport and private vehicle transport to more sustainable transport, walking, cycling, and public transport. And um, I just have like, I, as you were mentioning there, the the, the Kind of using Waterford City as a showcase. It's interesting that you can see in the maps that, that go along with the development plan, um, there's hardly a street in Waterford City that's not marked down as uh, for a new cycle path or a new public transport route. And I know there's kind of a, a background to that, that there was a lot of work done um, in, a, in a strategy that was developed for Waterford City a number of years ago. Um, but it would be great to see that a similar level of ambition for Dungarvan as a town in terms of getting that modal shift, because um, I suppose with the with the smarter travel that was there uh, going back uh, uh, quite a few years ago now, um, around the edges of the town, um, you know, some very good work was done. But in terms of actually getting into the middle of town, um, there's not too much. You're not very well served, and it's. For myself, like I live in Dungarvan, and even just cycling from Abbey Side to Dungarvan is a bit of a challenge. There's no good way of doing it um, without being mixed in with a load of traffic uh, and not feeling necessarily very safe. So I'm just wondering, is it possible um, to have that kind of, even if it's at a higher level than what's possible for Waterford City, to have that level of, of ambition um, spelled out for Dungarvan to make sure that we do get the infrastructure over the next six years to, to make that shift possible? Um, yeah, I, I, I think I, I, I suppose we're, we're fortunate. Um, well, we're fortunate in two respects that that Waterford City is, is is a regional city and that Dungarvan is a, a key town. Um, but um, I suppose in when you when you think of the hierarchy and what we've been talking about, um, the we're fortunate that that we have the the that the NTA are on board um, doing the the Waterford City Metropolitan Area Transport Strategy with us at the minute. Um, and that'll come back in, and that'll feed back into uh, our our draft plan process um, towards the end of quarter three and four of this year. So we would hope that uh, I suppose the version of the draft of the draft plan or the sorry the final development plan I suppose um, will be informed by that. Um, but I, I think uh, like what, what we have mentioned as well is that um, you know we, we do need to do that more granular local area plan piece. Um, Tremor and Lungarvan, uh, for instance, are, are two towns that we, we, we will have to do. We, we were mandatory obliged to do uh, local area plans for. So we, we will be doing those and, and part of that um, part of that 
projects, I think, um, will be informed by um, local transport plans and active travel plans. And I think, um, I think we had uh, we had Fergus Galvin on 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 one of the the the, the, um, the, the webinars which was last week, and you know they, they are working ahead, um, progressing uh, you know the process to to sort of put those in place or to to prepare them and, and have them put in place for for the likes of Tremor and Garvin. So um, I think you know it's work in progress, uh, but. Uh, I think you know the local area plan will have to be informed by that. Um, so we, I, I would hope um, that that uh, that the timing on, on those pieces will will sort of feed into our our strategy to 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 get our 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 um, our processes moving in terms of local area plans, like probably you know maybe quarter three next year. Um, but you're right, there is and there is a move I think, and again it's it's, it's like a little bit of baby steps, but I, I think Smarvel has done a lot for Dungarvan. and it's it's sort of shown um, ha, what what can be achieved with with some with some funding uh, and a significant funding I suppose. But um, it's you know if when you start to turn um, turn people's um, uh, I suppose uh, preferences away from the private car towards towards uh, sustainable modes, well then you know you can start maybe offering up spaces, car park spaces, and you know. Um, uh, um, uh, carriageway space to 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 those more sustainable modes. So I think you know we're certainly going in the right direction. We're we're a long way forward or on from where we were ten years ago. Great, thanks, Hugh. Is that okay, Christoph? Christor? Yep. Great, thanks, um, Richard. Um, I just want to check: Are you happy with the responses that you got there with relation to your question around the mapping of the Blackwater Valley, and also just making the document available as one volume? Are you happy with that? You just on mute there, Richard. Yep. Uh, I, I didn't see an answer on the Blackwater Valley. Sorry, what was the answer on that? Um, Liam, would you like to come in with your answer there? Liam is with us. Um, so, yep. Uh, Hugh's presentation, he had a map of the um, around Dungarvan, and there was a Blackwater Valley development. So, mm -hmm. so Liam's yep. just coming in there, he's just unmuting. Yeah, sorry about that. I was in the chat room there. Uh, I was trying to sort out some responses. Uh, yeah, the, the map um, that you uh, displayed earlier, uh, I suppose that what that's showing is it's showing a relationship between certain settlements within the Blackwater Valley. Uh, it was never an attempt to define a topographical area. Obviously, the valley of the Blackwater, as you say, does run the entire way down to the sea. Um, um, but I suppose what that map is attempting to demonstrate is that there's a synergy and there's a relationship between a number of settlements in that area, referred to broadly as the Blackwater Valley. Uh, so it's, it's yeah, it's, it's just uh, I'm in one of the settlements, Clashmore, and that's excluded. So we are part of the Blackwater Valley development. But your your little hashed area excludes us, so I wouldn't like that to go forward as the Blackwater Valley Development Zone. Yeah, certainly. You know, it's a very valid point. I'd say, you know, if you make a submission, um, you know, we, we hear what you're saying. We'll obviously take that on board. But I think, uh, you know, it's probably something worthy of a submission, and which will then be again reported on and fed through the system. Yeah. Okay. Right. And the other thing, just on the, the volume, you know, trying to search in, in our submission, we said about electric charge points and the chief executive's reply said, yes, that will be included. But to find it in the 180 pages is quite difficult. You have to go into it's about three different headings. So it'll be uh, much easier to be able to search the, the nine headings. So I think, Richard, what you're asking for is for volume four to 11, just be all combined into one PDF. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the response there was that that, that could be done. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, certainly perfect. We'll have a look at, I suppose, what we've tried to do is we've tried to break it down into chapters so that it just it makes it easier for people to download and, you know, the file sizes are smaller uh, when you're dealing with it online. Um, but I do appreciate that, you know, it makes it maybe difficult to find a particular reference or, you know, a number of references to a, a particular topic. So, uh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, uh, uploading a, a document with, with all of those chapters combined in one. 
Right, thank you. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. Um, Ithal, I'll um, just hand over to you for your question with regard to um, understanding the needs of and support for rural dwellers, and uh, specifically with relation to uh, local industries and the need for micro energy production. Would you like to come in there, Ithal? You're just on mute, Ithal, if you'd like to click that mute button. Thanks. Just, I live, I live in West Waterford and a lot of us feel that there is almost a policy of not allowing small local industries to develop, that there's a sort of feeling that that's for uh, larger towns and cities. And we feel very much that we also need to develop. We also need to be able to have a 10, 15 minute commute from our place of work to our homes and that that seems to be something that Waterford can aspire to, but not rural Waterford. Um, yeah, I can come back on that. Um, that's something I think that the councillors feel very strongly about. A lot of the debate that we had with the councillors before the draft was published was around rural issues, um, because I think a lot of people, particularly people in the western part of the county, do feel that, uh, you know, the rural um, uh, population and the rural communities are maybe being threatened uh, by national policy and by just the general demographic shifts that are happening in the world. Um, so I suppose we're keen to emphasize that the rural landscape uh, would be a lived in landscape, uh, that it should continue to be, you know, a, a community based approach uh, to planning and that local communities should be facilitated to to build houses for themselves to continue to live locally and again yeah that concept of you know people being able to work be educated uh, recreate and find employment locally is very important um, we would espouse the town center first approach because i think commercial development can be i suppose serviced an awful lot more easily uh, in um, on service sites in industrial areas in and around towns and villages and I suppose the nature of Ireland is that you're very rarely anywhere where you're more than 10 minutes away from a small town or a village uh, again the map that Hugh showed you know we've identified settlements at all scales uh, down to hamlets down to crossroads so I suppose we're, we're trying to work with Irish water to see you know where services can economically be provided and again, where we can manage traffic and where environmental issues can be managed. But that said, you know, there's still plenty of other industries that have traditionally located in the open countryside and will continue to do so. Uh, so it's not a case that, you know, economic development other than agriculture is prohibited. It's just, I suppose, the, the, the preference in the first instance is that it would go to somewhere where it can be serviced uh, more efficiently. Um, but, you know, if that can't be done, we go through a sequential test. So we look at, you know, service land, then if there's no service land available, we'll look at uh, designated settlements. If uh, that's not suitable, we'll look at maybe reuse of existing sites where, you know, maybe an industry is closed or has downsized. Um, but, you know, when you go through all of those steps, if um, a location on the farm or, um, you know, in, a, in an unserviced rural location is seen to be viable, uh, and reasonable alternative, but then, you know, that, that's certainly something that we'll work with the landowners and with the, the applicants to try and, you know, manage and deliver. Right, I take your word for it. <laughs> There'll be a big sea change, will there, in the approach to rural development after this development plan comes out? Yeah, well, I suppose we, we do want to see development everywhere. We're planning for growth across the county as a whole. Uh, you know, an awful lot of the discussion is around uh, Watford City and around Dungarvan, around Tremor and places like that, because, you know, that's where the, the, the highest levels of um, development are expected to occur. You know, we're planning for 50 and maybe even up to 60 percent growth in the city. But that doesn't mean that other places are going to be uh, ignored. Um, we're planning for 10% population growth, uh, which is very, very significant uh, in our rural areas. Uh, and that's in the open countryside as well as in the smaller towns and villages. So uh, that's that's a lot of people. That's a lot of growth that has to be planned for. And those people have to earn a living and, you know, they have to have services and they have to have community facilities. And as you say, those should be provided at a community level, at a level where people can uh, access those, you know, whether it's the parish or whether it's a rural district or whatever the appropriate, um, you know, level might be. 
Um, so it's certainly not a case that everybody, and you know, we, we're talking again about climate change and things like that. You know, it's it's not sustainable for the community in West Waterford to have to drive to uh, Waterford City every day, or even to have to drive to Dungarvan every day to work. Um, that's not the way we want to see the county develop. So, you know, if the community in the more remote parts of the county are to uh, thrive, well, then you know they need economic opportunity close by. So that's something that we'll work with you to try and see if we can you know, make happen and support. Great. Okay. Looking forward thanks very to it. Um, thanks, we'll move on. We're coming near to the end of our session, so we hope we can get through uh, the remainder of the questions that are there at the moment. Jay, I'll just pass over to you. Um, you have a query um, with relation to uh, concerns about changes to the zoning of lands. And there was a response in there. Are you happy with that or would you like to come in on that? Okay, so if Jay is not with us at the moment, we'll just move on to Daniel's question. So uh, Daniel, would you like to come in there with relation to, and again, just staying on the, on the topic of rural development, um, and your questions related to wind farms, and if more wind farms developments will be coming on stream, or if they will be um, moved offshore. Okay, so if Daniel can't come in on the question, I wonder if one of the planners would like just to come in and pick up on the question around wind farms. Um, yeah, I'm happy enough to come in on those unless you, you want to. Um, no, no, yeah, uh, on wind, uh, I know some local authorities have tried to include a policy in their development plan, basically saying no more wind energy in our county, um, but that's been uh, strongly resisted by the Office of the Planning Regulator. What we've been asked to do is to look at wind energy in terms of where it might be appropriate and to designate areas within the county where it might be appropriate and to designate other areas then where obviously it wouldn't be uh, appropriate or wouldn't be facilitated. Um, so, you know, the blanket ban is not something uh, that I think uh, we can run with. Um, but we are mapping the county we're looking at and you'll find it in the draft documents It's available in one of the appendices. We've looked at the landscape across the county. We've looked at the landscape resilience. We've looked at views and prospects and European designations, natural heritage areas, special areas of conservation, uh, looked at population density and all of those sorts of factors to see you know, where you know, we might be able to facilitate some additional wind energy. Um, but we would expect that the majority of new wind energy uh, potential will be realized offshore into the future. Uh, that seems to be the area where, you know, the, the, there's the, the best possible return on investment. Um, now, again, that throws up all other range of issues, you know, an awful lot of people would have a concern in relation to that, but wind energy will form part of our um, energy mix into the future. Uh, now it's broadening. Uh, we're looking at lots of other sources. Um, maybe 10, 15 years ago, it was all about wind, but now we're talking about, um, you know, other sources such as solar and other micro renewables. Um, so yeah, wind energy. We will um, we will have to consider wind energy, but uh, we have to consider, I suppose, you know, where and that, that that's the conversation that we're having now. Not that we can't have any, but if we are going to have some, where is it going to be? And I might just go back on a question that Jay asked, uh, I, I know uh, you uh, raised it there a second ago, Vanessa, about zoning. And I think it's just, it's an important point to make in response to that, but um, it's relevant um, to the process generally, which is at issues paper level, uh, which was our first round of public consultations, we couldn't take on board any submissions that people made in relation to land use zoning. That's just not allowed. Uh, the legislation is very clear on that. The issues paper is dealing with broad issues and can't deal with specific um, land use policies at a, you know, a property level or at a particular site level. Um, but now that we've moved to draft plan, we're very much talking about zoning. Uh, and the development plan that's on display at the moment, the draft that's on display does include zoning maps. So if you own land in any one of those settlements or if you live in any one of those settlements where there is land use zoning shown and mapped, I'd say have a look at those. And if you have a concern or if you have a suggestion, uh, put it down in writing to us and send it in to us. Now is the time to, to engage on that. And anybody making a submission about land use zoning, again, as I said earlier, that will have to be recorded, reported on, and brought back to the council chamber for consideration. 
Thanks very much, uh, Liam, for, the, for that clarification. Um, I'll hand over now to James. Um, James, you have a question there with regard to public transport and connectivity. Would you like to come in on that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Vanessa. Yeah, uh, no, Liam, Liam gave me the, an answer there, but what I, I'm concerned around is that we, we have, especially around Dungarvan, so if you take um, Ballon Road, for instance, it's a, a development piece of the infrastructure there. And yet it doesn't even have a town service, uh, transport service uh, between Dungarvan and, and we say Ballon Road. So there's a big dependability on, on car usage and bicycle usage. So it's these type of offshoot uh, little areas that would be concerned that may become isolated for the want of a better word um, and are, are not serviced or feed by an actual public service transport. Yeah, uh, it is a big challenge. Uh, we've been awarded uh, money from the NTA to look at active travel and sustainable travel and public transportation uh, across the county. And we're actually, it's one of three new teams that have been set up. Uh, the council is, is stepping up um, in three areas and setting up three new teams. Uh, one is an active travel team. Uh, we've already recruited a new senior engineer to lead that team. And we'll be filling a number of posts there, I think up to 12 posts. Uh, working with the NTA and working with local communities to identify sustainable transportation solutions into the future because, um, you know, we're not well served with public transport, uh, particularly, you know, internal linkages within the county. We have through routes, but, uh, you know, from one place to another, um, we're poorly served at the moment. Uh, so that has to be addressed. And um, there'll be an awful lot of emphasis on that over the, over the next few months and years. As I say, we're, we're putting a, a team, a dedicated team in place whose sole job will be to deal with active travel and sustainable transportation transportation. Um, we're also building a team uh, to deal with climate change. Um, they will be dedicated. Uh, while everything that we do in the council should have regard to climate change, we will have a climate change team uh, that will be delivering on our mitigation plan and will be, I suppose, working with the planning department and with the transportation department and with water services and with all the other sections to make sure that, you know, we're, we're all uh, rowing together and you know moving in the right direction and then a third team is a capital projects team uh, which has been established at the moment and I suppose that's to deliver on infrastructure and to deliver on big projects things like say the North Keys and the sustainable transportation bridge in the city centre and um, you know other um, you know big capital projects that are going to need a lot of um, managing. Hey. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks, Lee. Thanks for that. Um, we're near the end of our session where we're just coming up to the closing, but there are just a couple of extra comments and questions I'd just like to get through. And I see Avita or Avis there. You have a question. Would you like to come in on that regarding a swimming pool? Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. OK. Uh, yes, um, I, on behalf of Dungarvan Barris Cooter Swim Club and uh, the Triathlon Club in Dungarvan, we uh, were actively seeking um, a 25 metre uh, community swimming pool for Dungarvan. Um, I know there are a number of pools in Dungarvan, but they're all for leisure and members, and we don't get a look in. And uh, as you can see in the Olympics, we've sent a few swimmers to the Olympics and we would have aspirations like that too. All well, our swimmers are amazing. But we have to, at this moment, we have to go to Waterford at six o'clock in the mornings to accommodate our swimmers. And uh, we feel it's time to have one in Dungarvan. Is, do you think it's, it's feasible? And if so, where would the funding, where do you think the funding would come for that? Would anybody like to pick that up on the team? Um, yeah, I mean, like whether or not it's feasible, um, I suppose depends on on the, the funding. Um, uh, and uh, not wanted to give a short answer. I don't know if it's feasible. Um, I, I suppose it's uh, given the size of the town, it's comparable to to Tremor. Um, there's um, you know we have there's a facility in Tremor um, that I suppose is also used I suppose by 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 tourists and by people from outside the town. But um, I don't know. I think I think what um, uh, I, I imagine this 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 um, this query will probably continue to to um, to to uh, I suppose what's the word I'm looking for um, 
uh, I suppose it's something that we're going to have to, um, uh, I suppose, address in 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 terms of uh, the general immunity and the general, um, I suppose, the general uh, services that are available to um, uh, Dungarvan. Uh, you know, there, there is this, there is the existing sports facility, and there's land there available. Perhaps that might be, um, that might be uh, um, uh, a place to 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 um, uh, to consider for as a site. But again, I don't I'm, look at I, I'm not involved in it, um, uh, and it's something I think that maybe the the local elected members and indeed the the local manager for for Dungarvan needs to have a, a due consideration about. But um, I, I suppose we are conscious that you know we have this draft development plan to deal with. We will have a local area plan to deal with in Nongarvan. So as I said, I think it's 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 a uh, we may not there may not be a, a light at the end of the tunnel at the minute. There may not be a solution or or a, a some solution around it. But I think you know we have we have a we have a number of procedures to to work through statutory procedures, and I think you know those will those will give an opportunity maybe to have additional dialogue. And you know we've 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 been we've been having dialogue ourselves in, in a, around it with our colleagues. But um, I suppose there isn't a solution as of yet. I was just wondering, though, is there any monies there for even a feasibility study just to get it kick started? I, I did get a quotation for a feasibility study, and it's somewhere between five and ten thousand. Yeah, um, well, maybe, maybe I, I don't know. It's, again, it's, it's something that we'll have to come out of our dialogue with our colleagues. But um, I think maybe, uh, and maybe it's it's um, maybe it's something that forms part of a, a bigger um, complex. You know, um, I don't know. I, I really don't know um, because it's not something that we, we would have any control. Um, I suppose, as we said, there, our plan sort of tries to identify what, what the requirements are. Um, and and I, I, I appreciate there was a, there was probably about 30 or 40 submissions, I think, on, on the, the, the swimming pool um, at pre-draft stage. And again, it's something that, you know, is getting, is getting um, uh, I suppose, is getting afforded uh, additional dialogue. But um, I suppose we have to just keep at it. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much for that. And also for Christor coming in with a comment there around a feasibility study also. Um, I'm just going to hand over to Rita. I know Rita, you haven't come in yet. And just before you do, um, Ethel just has a, a question there. Is there going to be a local area plan for Pilltown? And what would that mean? So maybe you could just pick up on that question after Rita comes in with hers as well in relation to Rita, you have a comment on a climate emergency uh, there. Hi, Vanessa. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was just wondering, you know, following on from what Alan was saying, will the plan at least refer to, you know, Ireland's declaration of a climate biodiversity emergency? And, um, you know, because things really are critical and I understand the obligations, you know, that the local authority is under and uh, in as regards, you know, legislation now for growth, population growth. Um, but truly, like every day, there is kind of more frightening, if you like, um, uh, statistics or like that we may have already passed a threshold. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things that really strikes me is that um, is this might sound alarmist, but it's, I've thought a lot about it and read up various things about, you know, having food for people. And I, I can't help, you know, when particularly if you're on train, you're cycling, whatever, you look around, you see all these empty fields and most of the fields are dedicated to food for cattle. And something just seems wrong about that because the, the answer to environmental protection seems to be, you know, or certainly was to pack people into higher density development, which COVID has shown to be, you know, not very healthy for people if you've no balcony even or a small balcony. And you know, say, for instance, in Tower, County Cork, there was this, the Land Commission had these one acre cottages they gave to people so they'd be able to feed their families. And I, I, my own sense is that the density is based on an unsustainable agricultural model in a way and that everything has to change together, which I know is a bit maybe way off beam. But I just to be thinking about you know and global supply chains breaking down because there's a confluence of things happening now and that the relationship between the city and the towns and their hinterland you know and people having whether it's allotments even um particularly where there's high density penrose lane you know is there scope for developing you know a, 
uh, allotments for people. I know we're talking about Dungarvan now, but the same would apply to Dungarvan or any settlement. And also really looking at having localised food, I suppose, and an agricultural model, trying to build an agricultural model that is more sustainable, I suppose, and where people can be fed in a, in a really serious situation. I, that's really where I'm coming from. Thanks, Rita. Um, yeah, I, I, I go back to the, I go back to what um, you know uh, I, what I what I what I said to Alan, I suppose, in 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 response that you know this is a this is a land use plan. Um, we can we can affect some change, um, but we have to be realistic about that. Um, you know, we are not we're not going to change the 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 globalization, the model of globalization, industrialization of farming, and and other sort of you know all of that that food supply chain and the logistics chain and you know that that the you know change, changing the the are moving away from I suppose you know um, uh, over dependence on resources. I you know we 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 can manage the space that we have um, within the the planning act and the planning function, and that's what the development plan is about. Um, and I think. So I, I I do take your point um, in terms of of um, I suppose what COVID has shown us uh, in terms of you know our own building designs and um, our amenity spaces and I think we've all learned from that. Um, in some cases we've been fortunate. Well, we I suppose generally speaking we've been fortunate in Waterford because we do have a uh, in in general terms we have a you know a, a wealth of resources uh, and amenities at at, uh, at at short distance. So. But I think we need to manage those better, and and uh, part of the plan is is trying to look at that and how we how we manage the manage the resource and how we uh, try to ensure that it doesn't become uh, depleted or eroded or, or destroyed uh, in the process. I think in terms of in terms of the um, the allotments and all that, I think you know our, our, our land use matrix will facilitate that um, across a number of different land uses. So I think you know we, we we're trying to leave that open. We don't know where they should be. Um, we, we have, you know, the, the local authority would have some lands, I suppose, and I suppose the ones uh, just um, uh, having a, a, a city focus, unfortunately, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of based that side of the county, but, you know, the, the Valley Big Greens would be a, a, a certainly a success in terms of allotments in, in, in a city, um, in, in the city context, um, and I'm sure that's, that's achievable elsewhere, and there are examples elsewhere, and we, you know, you only have to go to your local market every Saturday, and of which there are plenty, and, you know, you can get uh, uh, reasonably fresh um, local produce and you know as long as you don't go down in the middle of, of um, December looking for a fresh uh, water pen or whatever pineapple you know I think we have to be a little bit realistic about what we can achieve um, and uh, to a certain extent um, I think you know the individual um, uh, you know the development plan is all about the common good and trying to uh, uh, achieve that um, and I think we have to sort of maybe put individual needs and wants to one side but that's my own personal view um, um, but uh, as I said I go back to the start you know the, the plan is a spatial plan um, and we have to try and uh, uh, I suppose arrange and manage um, the spatial expression of our of our places and uh, and that's what our, our discussion was around tonight and you know going back going back to where we start with you know the 10 minute concept getting everybody you know out of their cars or you know trying to get people trying to get people active looking at the health benefits of that and um, maybe getting people to engage uh, and interact more locally will will maybe um, will maybe influence people in terms of their their shift in 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 their their you know their their domestic um, uh, consumption uh, processes and um, you know their spending etc yeah, thanks, Hugh. Yeah, and I think the two teams you're talking about are great, like to have, you know, it'll certainly um, galvanise things, you know, and, and just one thing on that was I, I attended an EPA um, conference there a while ago and the Chief Justice was on it and was talking, he's very interested in the idea of an environmental court, and one of the things that he was saying was how you need to see the environment as an integrated whole, not to kind of just have climate change, because like nature restoring nature is probably the single best way to to stop climate change really because the technology of itself it can be helpful but it's the two things coming together but you know um and, and the chapter does seem to integrate that i noticed you know it has like um, biodiversity and climate change together you know which is it's the integration so it's not that but maybe just to reference the climate emergency biodiversity emergency um environmental emergency i suppose really that we have 
you know. Um, anyway, thanks. Thanks. Um, thanks very much, Rita. And I see there are comments coming in there from Chris Dore and from Alan as well and others um, just supporting those last points on climate change. And this chat will be saved and the planners will have that afterwards. Um, I, we need to close out. We could stay here talking a lot more about this topic. Could I ask uh, about the local area oh, development? Sorry, yeah. Apologies, Ital, yes. Sorry, sorry, Ethel. I, I knew there was another question there. What was that question? But um, sorry, yeah. The I, I think um, you know the, the 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 local area plan system. The statutory local area plans are are for towns um, uh, or urban towns in essence, and they're sort of towns with with a population of of more than fifteen hundred. But I think we we're conscious of the fact that um, uh, that there are a lot of towns out there that that are, are smaller than that, and there are a lot of small little nodes and and crossroads, as Liam uh, suggested. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different scales and and types of of places across rural world, and we need to we need to look at at trying to um, maybe engage around those. So, um, I, I think you know the resource dependent. Um, I think we'd be we we will be um, uh, you know we, we will be I suppose moving to 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 do local area plans for the the larger towns, the mandatory ones, as we said earlier, the ones we have to do them for 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 um, Tremor and Ungarvan, and I think after that. We'd be looking at at um, you know the, the likes of uh, Dunmore, Portlaw, um, Lismore, um, and the Gwaeltot. Um and I think once we get through that, um, we 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 will um, uh, will I, I would be suggesting that we will be looking or trying to look at at maybe village design statements or some other form of of local non statutory local planning to to engage with local communities and and try and tease out what's important to them and how we can maybe protect or enhance or you know do something around it um and i think it's important that you know that those those small steps that, that rita was was mentioning that that you know the small steps towards um you know mitigating and adapting to climate change i think a lot of that will come at a very local level and a granular level uh, and in some instances they will be nature-based solutions or the you know it, it depends um it could be it could be just simply you know um tree planting and pollinator planting or it could be a, a bigger issue around uh, surface water swales or or indeed um wastewater or any other sort of issue so it's it's you know i think i think there's there's potential there it is resource dependent um but we, you know our our um our objective certainly would be to to, to look at those smaller settlements and in, in what we can do in in real terms what is your timeline? Well, our, our time, I suppose, is um, our, our, this draft plan is going to uh, will will be completed this time next year. Um, there's a statutory uh, time frame then for looking at those uh, those other local area plans. The difficulty with the local area plans is that there 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 are guide there is guidance there about what local area plan has to be or what it should be, um, and it's quite old. But uh, um, and and if you look at if you trawl to all the different um, local authority websites across the country, you'll see different approaches towards local area planning. Um, so I think we need to we need to ha have a good think uh, uh, about where we want to pitch the local area plans in terms of how long the documents are. I mean, if you look at the current ones, they're quite they're quite long. They're 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 almost as long as 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 well. They're not quite, but they're they're they're, they're half the length of the volume one of the the city and county the draft plan. So I think we need to be a little bit. Um, more strict about um, trying to make or, or prepare and, and and print shorter plans. Um, so if we can do that with the local area plans um, and and uh, move them quickly, we can we can move on to doing the smaller settlements. But again, like it's it's eighteen months before we, we in in the best case scenario that we'll have local area plans for the likes of Tremor and Garvin. So we're now. talking about twenty twenty four. You're talking, you're talking, yeah, I mean, yeah, I suppose realistically, yeah, you know, um, and that's if we can retain the same amount of resources that we have, and that's that's another challenge. Yeah, I think, as you said, resourcing is a big challenge for us. Um, in terms of planners who are working uh, exclusively on forward planning and the development plan, we've got three people. Uh, it's you, Marcus, and one other uh, who's on leave this evening, otherwise he'd be here. Uh, and that's it. And they're trying to plan the city and the county and all of the major urban settlements within the county, as well as all of the other, I suppose, policy areas that they've got to cover. So uh, I suppose, you know, to be honest with you, you know, uh, being realistic about it, it's unlikely that we'll have any more than about a half a dozen local area plans, uh, I would have thought, for our larger urban settlements. And I'd say smaller places, if you're interested, I think you might have mentioned Pilltown, somewhere like Pilltown. Uh, I think... I would suggest that those will probably be um, 
whether or not they happen and when they happen in terms of village design statements, I think will be largely dependent on uh, community activation and community involvement. We can certainly work with the communities and we can help and there are models and there are templates there for village design statements, but I think in those scenarios we'll be very much supporting and working with the community to help develop a plan rather than promising to deliver one ourselves, you know, at some mm. point. Uh, who, who can who can send me a reference as to where we could look at a good small village development plan? I, I think I think you tell if you, if you look at the uh, the Heritage Council site, um, if if you go in there, the, I suppose the Heritage Council have been have been pr pr promoting the you know village design statements for for a number of years, and again a lot of it is built around the uh, sort of a UK model. Um, but if if you go on if you go on to the Heritage Council site, I I. I I imagine if you go into their publications, you'll find some you'll find some different ones in there. And that's what you're talking about. Sorry, I don't want to dominate. I'm, I'm no, I, no. Don't, I don't mean to be a village pub and politician. <laughs> yeah, no, but, I think if a community comes forward and, you know, there's there, there is a, a, a well-developed uh, community um, group. Uh, and they're prepared to, you know, to to work to try and develop a, a vision for their own community. We'll certainly work alongside you and help you in any way that we can uh, to try and help to realise that. Um, but I, I would be slow, I suppose, to promise that we off our own bats are going to deliver a, a plan for Piltown anytime soon. Um, but as I said, we're, we're, we're here to help in any way we can. Thank you. Great. Thanks for that, um, Ital, and, and the responses there. We've come to the end of our meeting and I know there, there's an, uh, more comments that are there and questions, um, but I'm going to hand over to Liam now who's going to close out the meeting and maybe Liam, you can just indicate how people can still get involved and have any additional questions answered um, before the end of the consultation period. Thanks Liam. And thanks everyone for your participation for a really interesting discussion this evening. Yeah, thanks very much, Vanessa, and just thanks to yourself in the first instance for all your help over the last six sessions, um, you know, keeping us uh, on our toes and keeping the conversation going. But in reality, the conversations tended to be quite lively anyway. We had great participation throughout. And again, tonight, uh, you know, I found it to be very, uh, you know, a very good conversation. Um, you know, a lot of issues have come up there. Uh, we'll certainly be taking all of this on board. Um, but I, I, I keep stressing the point, you know, I think people need to make submissions um, you know, this is a conversation, but, you know, if you've got a particular issue and you want to see that addressed by the council, uh, I would say put it down in writing and send it into us as a submission, and then it has to be addressed. Um, you know, it won't get lost in the fog or in the noise. Uh, it will be given its own unique uh, reference number. It will be referenced in the document and there'll be a specific response to each one which has to be prepared. Um, so, you know, the, the, the website, the portal is the best way to do that. Um, again, you've heard the address uh, a dozen times today. It's uh, consult.watercouncil.ie. Go online there, register, make your submission through uh, the portal. Um, that, that, that's the easiest way for us to track and manage submissions. But if you have a difficulty doing that, uh, we'll take submissions in writing in the old fashioned way, just stick in the post and send it in to us or send it to us by email. But I would encourage people to use the portal if at all possible. Um, we're available throughout the process. Uh, on the website, you'll find our phone number, you'll find our email address, get in contact with us. Um, you know, this is a, an open dialogue from now until the end of August. Um, so, you know, as you read through the document, if anything, you know, concerns you or if you've got a query, just come on to us and we'll, we'll get back to you as quickly as we can. And um, it's not the end. Uh, we're halfway there, um, but there will be another consultation again early next year. Um, but I suppose this is where all of the... Um, this is where we can consider the direction that we're going in. You know, at the early stage, the issues paper, we were talking about broad concepts. Now we have a draft. Uh, it's time to take it apart and put it back together again. The next round of public consultation will be about, you know, specific issues more so than the broad direction. I think, you know, if you've got a concern about the broad direction and certainly climate change and environmental issues have figured um, strongly in all of our conversations over the last two weeks. And I think that's something we have to have a look at. People said tonight, it's hard to over overestimate or to not sound like maybe we're catastrophizing the situation in relation to climate change, but um, you know, absolutely that is the case. You know, we're all concerned about it. And uh, if we have to maybe 
highlight that to a greater degree in the draft, well then, you know, I don't see any great difficulty with that at all. And um, anybody that suggested that we should do that, I'd say send us in a submission. Uh, you, you won't find any resistance from our end. So That's again, thanks very much. And um, we will, I'm sure I'll be talking again over the, over the weeks ahead um, and keep in touch.